V2 PTE Academy. We are providing online PTE coaching and monthly practice test. You can also stay connected with us. Facebook, Instagram and Telegram. For more information visit our WhatsApp on given number. Subscribe our YouTube channel and press the bell icon for more updates. The Venezuelan authorities say they have suppressed what they termed a terrorist attack on an army base in the city of Valencia. Diosdado Cabello of the governing United Socialist Party said loyal troops re-established security at the base. Officials said seven people had been arrested and at least one of them died. Afghan officials say at least 50 people, including women and children, have been killed by militants in the northern province of Saripul. A spokesman told the BBC that insurgents attacked security checkpoints and entered a village, killing civilians, among them women and children. He said Taliban and Islamic State fighters were involved. The Taliban has denied killing civilians. They say they killed 28 members of a local militia. Executive Vice President of the U.S. Government's Overseas Private Investment Corporation, or OPIC, David Bohigian, and other U.S. government officials traveled to Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia in August to promote U.S. investment in those countries. OPIC is the U.S. government's development finance institution. It mobilizes private capital to help address critical development challenges and in doing so advances U.S. foreign policy and national security priorities. On August 14th, the U.S. delegation met with Armenian Minister of Economic Development and Investments, Artsvik Minasin.
Within the past few minutes, the election commission in Kenya has declared that Tuesday's presidential election was won by the incumbent Uhuru Kenyatta. The opposition, which has complained of fraud, has rejected the result. An opposition spokesman described the process as a masquerade. World leaders have expressed concern at the war of words between Washington and Pyongyang over North Korea's nuclear program. After President Trump said the US military was locked and loaded, North Korea accused him of driving the situation to the brink brink of nuclear war. Russia, China and Germany have all appealed for calm and further diplomatic efforts. First, though, the U.S. government has released its monthly jobs report. It's one measure of how the economy as a whole is doing. The report that just came out is for the month of September, and it was a disappointment. Economists had expected that 479,000 jobs would have been added last month. The actual number was well below half that, according to the U.S. Labor Department. It was the second month in a row that the number of jobs added to the American economy was dramatically lower than what economists predicted, and no one knows exactly why the growth in this area has slowed down. Many economists point to continued concerns about the coronavirus pandemic and the Delta variant of the disease.
Even though they usually start to decrease this time of year, the average price for a gallon of gasoline in the United States hit $3.27 this week. That's its highest price in seven years, and it's almost double what it was last spring when roads and runways were nearly empty because of the COVID pandemic. There are several components to the price of gasoline. The cost of getting it to gas stations, federal and state taxes, the costs of refining it, the profits gas companies make, they all factor in. But the biggest chunk of what we pay, accounting for 43% of the cost of gasoline, is the price of the crude oil gas is made from. And not coincidentally, crude is also at its highest price in seven years at just over $80 per barrel. The enduring defeat of ISIS remains a top priority for the United States. The U.S.-led global coalition to defeat ISIS is leading stabilization efforts that consolidate military gains, restore basic essential services, and enable Syrians to voluntarily and safely return to their homes in Raqqa and other former ISIS strongholds. Assistance includes explosive hazard and rubble removal, providing clean water, rehabilitating electricity networks, and other basic necessities. Since April, the United States has elicited approximately $300 million in contributions and pledges from coalition partners to support immediate stabilization and early recovery initiatives in areas liberated from ISIS in northeast Syria.
The U.S. government says it's made progress in an effort to relieve some of the shipping problems that have clogged up the international supply chain. The government does not control that chain. It's largely made up of private port operators, trucking companies, railroads, and warehouses. But the Biden administration is putting its support behind a plan for the Port of Los Angeles to operate 24-7 and for large companies like Walmart, Home Depot, and UPS to ship more goods at night. California's Port of Los Angeles is one of the most congested ports on Earth. 40% of all the containers shipped to America come through here and at the Port of Long Beach. Economic analysts and trade leaders say this is a step in the right direction, but that it won't make a major impact in supply problems. First, though, family members, politicians, historians, and civil rights advocates are paying tribute to Colin Powell, an American military and political leader who passed away Monday at age 84. Powell had an extraordinary resume, dating all the way back to his work in the Reserve Officers Training Corps while he was in college. At that time, Powell attained the ROTC's highest rank, and he continued to advance his military career from there. Powell served in combat during the Vietnam War and became a four-star general in the U.S. Army. During the presidency of Ronald Reagan, Powell became America's first black national security advisor. Under President George H.W. Bush, Powell became the first African-American chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, the country's highest-ranking military officer.
Two former U.S. Republican presidents, George Bush Sr. and his son, George W., have called on Americans to reject racism and anti-Semitism. It's being seen as a rebuke to Donald Trump for his comments about who was responsible for clashes in Charlottesville on Saturday. Mr. Trump sparked fury when he again blamed both anti-racist protesters and white supremacists. One demonstrator, Heather Heyer, was killed. At her memorial service, her mother said the killer had wanted to silence her daughter, but it ended up magnifying her. President Trump has announced he's dismantling two advisory panels made up mainly of senior business figures. Several resigned in the controversy over the U.S. leader's reaction to events in Charlottesville. The authorities in the Spanish city of Barcelona say 13 people have been killed and 80 injured by a van, which deliberately drove into them at a popular tourist market. The vehicle moved at speed through Las Ramblas in the city centre, before being abandoned by the driver who ran away. Hundreds of tourists and local people took shelter in shops and churches as police searched for suspects. Hours later, two of them, including a man of Moroccan origin, were arrested. Spanish media say another suspect was killed in a police shootout on the outskirts of the city. The Spanish Prime Minister, Mariana Rajoy, who's, in, who's on his way to Barcelona, says he'll be coordinating efforts to reinforce security, while the Catalan president, Carles Puigdemont, has called for solidarity.